every responsible citizen should have his own currency reserves, his fo own foreign exchange reserves in the form of gold, silver and platinum. Because, and this people don't seem to understand, that nobody can trust a central banker. They're all a bunch of liars, incompetent people who have no clue about what is happening in the real world. These are academics. None of them has ever managed a business. None of them has ever started a business. They are all what you would call intellectual morons. They went to fine universities, then they got the job at the Fed through some connections, usually political connections. And then the worst people that this is in politics is it is like this. The worst get promoted. So you end up at the top with completely incompetent leaders. You look at the last three Fed chairpersons in the US, all complete nobodies. You look at the ECB. Draghi was smart, but he was devious. He pushed interest rates down and he was politically motivated to keep the EU together. And under him, interest rates were negative. In history of mankind, I've never seen negative interest rates. It is an expropriation of decent people who have saved during their lifetime and put some money aside. As you know, in the last, say, 10 years, following 2009, the central banks in the Western world printed money. And as a result of this printing of money and artificially, and this again, I need to point out, it was artificially low interest rates engineered by central banks banks with the sole reason to push up asset prices. In other words, it favored the wealthy people at the expense of ordinary people whose affordability went down, you understand? If property prices go up like a rocket in Seattle and San Francisco, ordinary people who are saving money and young people cannot afford to buy these properties, period. So this is the policy that they embarked upon. But when money is free, in other words, interest rates are next to zero, you get also a lot of stupid companies coming up. If interest rates are 12% per annum and you and I, we start the business, then we have to earn 12% per annum just to pay the interest on the loans and so forth. But if interest rates are at zero, you and I, we can start any company and never pay you know, we can essentially run the company endlessly as long as interest rates are next to zero. And here I have to point out who the great beneficiaries of these policies were. Governments, the socialists who, this is a creeping socialism, like a cancer in that finances the expansion of destructive bureaucracy at the expense of hardworking entrepreneurs. And if there is no economic growth, you don't have to ask for a long time, you know, why and this and so. You can point out it is because the government is so big, there cannot be any growth. No, not only cannot there be any growth, there must be a contraction because whatever the government touches, it Fs up. Uh, the small shops were asked to close down and so forth, but not 7-Eleven, which is owned by one of the wealthy Thai tycoons. And so actually some people did benefit from the reaction or the policies implemented by incompetent but dictatorial democratically elected governments. This is something every citizen must ask himself. How is it possible that we were taught at school democracy is the best system because it is free and what you have is despotic governments like you have in Canada? There is an answer to everything that is short term and long term. Near term, I don't think the dollar will collapse but other people think it will collapse. But uh, my sense is that the dollar has become a bit oversold and that there are too many searches on Google <laughs> about the de-dollarization of the world. But the trend is there. You have to be brain damaged if you're Russia, China, India, Brazil, or any country to keep a single dollar in reserves with the Fed in America because they may take it away.
They took it away from the Taliban, the poorest countries where there is starvation. The Americans, they take their assets away. I mean, it's hard to believe. They go around the world and talk about human rights and this and that and freedom. And one of the most impoverished people where actually people are starving, they take the reserves away. The central banks bought on two occasions significant quantities of gold between 1960 and 1971 before the dollar depreciation was initiated in August 1971 under President Nixon when they closed the gold windows. And now in the last two years, central banks around the world have again been accumulating gold. I'm not asking anyone to believe that gold will shoot up right away and so forth. Uh, if you compare gold to other commodities, like say agricultural commodities, gold is not that cheap or it's relatively expensive compared to platinum and silver. But as a long term, if wealth preservation is your ambition, if the purchasing power of your dollar is important to you, if you don't own any gold, I don't know who can help you, then you deserve to be impoverished. I think it's time to preserve wealth, quite frankly. But in preserving wealth, you may have to take some aggressive moves and you may have to take insurance policies. Let's say we can agree today that commercial properties are not particularly attractive because of various factors. Some governments, they deliberately want to destroy inner cities. These are mostly progressive Democrats. They sit in New York and in Chicago, in Seattle and in San Francisco. All these policies are designed to kill businesses in these regions. And so you have people packing their bags and moving out because in these cities, as wealthy people live, the tax rate will go up. So they leave and they go to states that are freer. They're not entirely free, but they are freer. They go to Texas, they go to Florida. And uh, so real estate is very fragmented. You understand? Maybe real estate in San Francisco will go down a lot, but it can go up a lot in, say, Tennessee, in uh, Nashville or in, in Miss, uh, Memphis mm -hmm. and so forth. And then you also have a factor that is important to consider. 50 years ago, when I started to work, you had to be in a financial center if you were in the financial service industry. So I had to be in New York or Zurich or Hong Kong or London and so forth. Nowadays, you sit in Montenegro and I sit in Chiang Mai and we have our Bloomberg machine. We can trade and uh, invest as well as someone else who is sitting in a financial center. And we can do that at a much lower cost. So if people talk about real estate and trends, I can tell you if you go to Europe, you go to Portugal, to Spain, Italy. I mean, Sicily belongs to Italy, but I rank it separately because it's a little bit different okay. ca cat. Uh, and you go to Balkan countries like Croatia and where you sit in Montenegro. You can go into small villages. You can get a property for almost nothing. In some Italian, even in Switzerland, there are some villages. They will give you the property, but you have to live there and you have to maintain it. When we look at uh, events such as we have at the present time, we always have to look at what are the causes of the malaise, what are the causes of the disruptions in daily lives in financial market. And uh, I have to say, we have to go back to the last major crisis, 2008-2009, and the consequences of which were that central banks uh, believed that they can solve all the problems by keeping interest rates artificially low and by printing money. So they printed money and kept interest rates essentially in the US, as you know, around the zero level for essentially more than 10 years, starting with the end of 2008 until 2020. 21 when they began to increase interest rates but during that whole period of time they argued well there's no inflation well 
the way they look at inflation, there was maybe no inflation. But the way normal people look at inflation and the people who have knowledge of economic um, affairs, there was inflation, but it wasn't so much in consumer prices because you have to see that over the last 20 years, China opened up and China with its opening and its competitiveness put pressure on consumer good price. But what went up? or asset prices, in other words, real estate price. And uh, as a result of the rise in real estate prices, also rents and so forth, stock prices went up, bond prices went up, collectibles went up, and of course, cryptocurrencies went through the roof. Everybody said, oh, this is all great. We can continue to print money and this is a wonderful environment. And as you can imagine, the portfolio managers and everybody in the financial sector and everybody who benefits from rising asset price, uh, real estate brokers, stock brokers, fund managers, they all applauded the central bank who kept interest rates artificially low. And that laid the seed for the current price increases that we're seeing. And so the Fed belatedly started to increase interest rates. They were a little bit better than the ECB and the Bank of Japan, but they were late. And so they increased rates and the rate of increase has been sharp. But the rate of inflation, such as we have today, say every household has a different rate of consumer price inflation. Your inflation is say 8%, maybe 20%. Some people have a low rate of inflation, but suddenly it jumps. My inflation is not so high so far because beer hasn't gone up for the last two years in Thailand. And uh, I managed to get cigarettes at a lower price. It must be between six and, as you say, 15 to 20 percent, depending on the household and where the household lives and so forth and so on. And taxes, by the way, what you have to pay the government for everything is going up all the time, except the quality of the government is going down all the time at the same time. So we would have to adjust this because the quality is Tumbling to make the point, say in the 70s, when inflation was at this level, the discount rate went to 12% in 1973-74. Then yes. it fell by half to 6%, but then it rose again into 1980-81. But at the present time, I'm sorry to say, we have still plenty of liquidity around that was printed in 2020. And a little bit has been taken back, but not all that much. And interest rates, the 10-year notes in the US, the 10-year government bond is yielding to today 3.35%. In other words, the rate of interest is negative in real terms. As you see today, you have the Nasdaq going ballistic. Meta is up like 23 or 25 percent. These are symptoms that there is too much liquidity. If there was tight liquidity, this speculation would not happen at the present time. The Fed is actually in a very difficult position because, uh, in my view, they would have to really bring uh, inflation under control, they would have to increase the Fed fund rate to about 8%, 9%. The government is bankrupt at 8% because the government debt has to be paid them. You understand the whole system is not geared to that, whereby I have to say or make one observation. If you travel today to Turkey, Istanbul, say, you will have an inflation of around 80% per annum, eight zero, okay? And you w walk around the street and you go to restaurants and you go shopping, all functions reasonably well. The system can adjust for a while to high rates of inflation before it collapses. This is for you optimist. It leads to a collapse. But in the meantime, during this period of excess liquidity that fuels the price increases, there are huge opportunities in the stock market and in the property market. I would say once you're at 30%, the past is that it will go to 40%. And once you're at 40%, it will go to 50%. You understand? It's a progression and you can stop this progression at any time, but it is extremely painful. And looking 
out the central bankers i've never seen in my life i worked already 50 years since 1970 i started working in 1970 on wall street i've never seen such a low quality of central bankers around the world lockhart in europe she is the head of the ecb she has no clue whatsoever about economic issues she's a lawyer a lawyer could learn but she has the arrogance that she doesn't think that she needs to learn anything. And Powell the same, he doesn't know much. He never read all the economic classical books. Yellen is a clueless person. If you look back at the markets 2020 to today, we had in 2020 a sharp sell-off in February, March, and then a rally, okay? And uh, what rallied a lot are the momentum stocks, the meme stock, the uh, unicorn backs, and so forth. So that then went up strongly and it peaked out in January, February 2021. So these stocks, January 2021, we're 2023. So a lot of these stocks, I call them the garbage stock, have been in bear markets already for two years. They became very oversold, like Carvana or AMC or GameStop and so forth. And also the big stocks, the fine stocks, they were down. You can watch the ARC Innovation Fund. ARC was down at the bottom around 80% from the peak. It's also run by a genius in financial matters. She should be the next central bank. Because then they we would have money printing like there is no tomorrow. Which <laughs> Cassie would at the central bank at the Federal Reserve. And the markets will go ballistic. <laughs>